last time we saw how uh, we could add the axiom of constructibility, V equals L to the ZF axioms. And this will be no more an inconsistent system than the system just ZF alone being inconsistent. This was our first example of a relative con uh, consistency argument. In the lecture before that, we showed how the axiom of choice held in L. So actually exactly the same moves as we showed for the axiom V equals L of constructibility will show that the axiom of choice can also be consistently added to the axioms of ZF. So we'll start out today by doing that argument, which will serve as a refresher for the previous relative consistency argument. And then we'll move on to the other great usage that Gödel made for L, which was to show that the continuum hypothesis was consistent with the axioms of ZF. Indeed, the generalized continuum hypothesis. So that's a slightly more elaborate argument, right? And that'll be taking up the rest of the lecture. So first, relative consistency of AC. This is theorem 416 in the notes. So, so Gödel, and then this is about 1939. If Z is, is consistent, so is, con, so is ZF with the axiom of choice. And actually it's pretty much the same as for V equals L. It's shown from ZF that the axiom of choice held in L and constructed a global well ordering of the whole universe. Also that given any axiom of ZF, it held relativized to L which will abbreviate like that. So these were separate arguments, but of course we can put those arguments together and we get that ZF plus AC holds relativized to L. And so again, an argument by contraposition, we assume that this is inconsistent. So this means from ZF and AC, we can deduce something under its negation. Proves both phi and not phi. Okay, proof, finite object, it's just a list of lines of either axioms or things we've derived using first order logic from previous lines. And it ends up with phi and not phi here. All of these axioms that are needed for this to drive this contradiction are true in L. So if all these hypotheses are true in L, anything I can deduce from is true in L. And now it's exactly as before. It's just plain sailing. This is equivalent to ZF proving phi holds in L and not phi holds in L. And this is just definition of relativization.
So I've got a statement and its negation has been proven from ZF alone. So ZF is not consistent. So we've proven the contrapositive here. Okay. So that tidies that up then from last time. So it's our second relative consistency proof. So we can think of this as paraphrased as saying, <clears throat> it's safe to add AC to the axioms of ZF. It's no more of a dangerous system than it was before. So what we now want to do is uh, <coughs> look at the generalized continuum hypothesis. In L. So recall what we mean by this. It's saying that 2 to the omega alpha is omega alpha plus 1. Or in terms of alephs, 2 to the aleph alpha is aleph alpha plus 1. So this is for all alpha. So this is the GCH, generalized continuum hypothesis. And CH is just the statement that two to the omega is omega one. Again, omega is just an abbreviation for omega zero. So the power set of omega is the very next cardinal it could be. The power set of omega alpha is the very next cardinal it could be in terms of cardinality. Fine. So we're going to prove a lemma, um, which is a great utility actually in said theory, and we'll only be using it just in this uh, GCH argument in L. We should also be using a number of things from just logic in general. Right? So just so that it doesn't come as a surprise later, if I've got two structures, I've got one structure A and I've got another structure B, Right. And if these are isomorphic structures in a particular language, any formula, sorry, any sentence that's true in A will be true in B and vice versa. Being isomorphic means they've got the same shape. So anything true in one is true in the other. I say sentence, meaning no free variables here. Any sentence of the language appropriate for discussing these structures appropriate for the discussion of structures such as AB. Sigma say. We're going to have that sigma satisfies is true in A if and only if it's true in B. I mean, I've said it slightly more generally. Of course, with A and B are going to be sets for us. But I mean, for example, if these were groups, isomorphic groups, satisfy the same expressions same sentences in the language of group theory. And often mathematicians, they don't bother what the underlying field of a group is. 
Isomorphism is almost practically the same as equality for them. They're only interested in results up to isomorphism. So, so we shall use this for structures in set theory. If I have x, epsilon is isomorphic to y epsilon here. Then again, the same sentences will be true in both. If I've got a map pi from some structure here to a structure here, which is an isomorphism, And phi is true of some u in x. u perhaps put in for some variable vk. If this is an isomorphism, then phi is going to be true of pi of u put in for that variable on the y side. So isomorphisms preserve truth is really the point I'm getting at. Right? It preserves meaning. Of course, if phi is a sentence, we don't need to put any u's here in for any of the free variables. Right? So that we will we will use this elementary idea. Right? Okay, the condensation theorem, condensation lemma, it's called here, four four seventeen. Now, I've got a structure x epsilon, and it's an elementary substructure of L alpha epsilon here. I'll say what again, I'll re remind us what that means in a moment. I want all the axioms of ZF minus true in L alpha. or the axiom sigma one is true in L alpha. This was the conjunction of the finitely many axioms that made the def function absolute. So this is the same sigma one as from lemma 412. Then there is a gamma less than or equal to alpha with x epsilon isomorphic to L gamma epsilon. This is the conclusion of the condensation. So recall here, again, see the appendix. I 
I may have a structure A, and there may be another B here. Where B is contained in A. Means that for any formula, phi and maybe with three variables, up V0 up to Vn, and any B0 up to Bn in B. Yeah. We have reflection between A and B. The assignment of the b's to the free variables of the formula phi makes this true in A, even though it's about the b's that are in here. It's the same truth value. So being an elementary substructure in the language says anything I can say about the objects in B, if it's true in B, if and only if it's true in A, about those same objects. So that's what we're going to, this idea we're going to apply here. My structures are in alpha and X. So any B0 up to Bn in X, if some formula makes that true of that tuple in X, then it does so in L alpha and vice versa. So again, just to emphasize, the elementary substructure hood is about strings of parameters from the smaller collection, smaller substructure. So we say B is an elementary substructure of A. Okay, so how are we going to argue this? I'm going to assume that sigma one holds in L alpha. If you want, you can think of all of these axioms holding in L alpha, but only this finite number will do. Hence, by that lemma 412, we have that L in the sense of this term here is as many levels of the L hierarchy as there are ordinals over here. In other words, L alpha thinks every set is constructible. Any set in L, as far as L alpha is concerned, is in L alpha. And that's what we were calling the axiom of constructibility. Again, recall, for every set, there is a beta. So for every set X, there is a beta, such that X is in L beta. So V equals L holds in L alpha. 
Now, by the correctness theorem that links truth via relativization and our semantic definition of truth, what it means to be have a assignment make a formula true in a structure. So by the correctness, theorem. I have the V equals L holds in L alpha if and only if L alpha epsilon is a model of this sentence. Okay, no free variables in here. Right? It's just an outright assertion about all sets. We're assuming that this is a substructure of this. So the sentence is true there too. Now what I can do is we've said, you may have noticed, we said nothing about the transitivity of X or otherwise. Indeed, in general, it won't be transitive. But this is epsilon. It is a extensional well-founded relation. So I can apply the mostovsky shepherdson collapsing lemma to transitivize X. So I find an isomorphic, but transitive copy of X. And so the Y is unique. Remember the uniqueness in the collapsing lemma said, any structure with a transitive, sorry, any structure with a well-founded extensional relation is isomorphic to a unique transitive structure. with Y, the unique transitive set here. Isomorphic to X. So here's something that's true in X. Y is isomorphic to it by what I was my preamble before I started the condensation lemma. I've got that this also thinks V equals L. So this is a transitive class of sets, right? It's a set of sets, right? So I applied that lemma 412 again. I look at L in the sense of why. I should also be saying here, well, I could also have said at the same time, um, that we had that L alpha, in fact, I should, should really be saying, was sigma one is true in L alpha. So I have sigma one is true in L alpha. So this also holds here. I have sigma one here holding in L alpha. So again, this holds in X. So it holds in Y. Because sigma one holds in Y, I can now look at the L hierarchy as defined in Y. <clears throat> and I'm going to get that this is just L 
intersect y, or in other words, it's L built for as many ordinals as there are in y here. So this was what we were calling theta in that lemma. If the ordinals of the term here were theta, L constructed inside the term gave us L theta. But the ordinals inside Y, right here, are simply just the ordinals of, well, up to the height of Y here. Y is a model of every set is in a level of the L hierarchy. B equals L holds in Y. We have for every set X in Y, there's a beta in Y such that X is in L beta in the sense of Y. But this is just L beta. Hence, Y is then just this, this here. So Y is some L gamma, where gamma is the ordinals that are in Y. So I can take my gamma, right, which I wanted up here, to be the ordinals of Y. And we're done with the condensation. So now we'll move on to the proof of the GCH in L proper. But again, prior to that, we're going to use some other lemma from logic, the downward lervenheim skolem theorem. So let's uh, just remind ourselves as to what that is so that it's not a shock when we come to, come to it in the theorem. So this is the downward lervenheim skolem theorem. which you can again find in the appendix. So, and that's about looking at elementary substructures of first order structures A of some arbitrary size and looking at some elementary substructure which might perhaps be countable or something smaller. So as I've got an infinite structure here, and I suppose I've got some subset of the structure X. So then there's a, a subset, an elementary substructure B, an elementary substructure of A in the sense of perform. And X is contained in the domain of B. And the idea is that B should be no, no bigger than X, at least if X is infinite. I mean, X could be empty or finite, in which case B is countable. <clears throat> but if X is infinite, B should have the same size as X. It's 
cardinality of b, so we'll put it like this, the cardinality of x or aleph zero in case x is finite. Now how we're going to use this is with an a, for example, this will be of the form z epsilon will be our structure there. And we'll have some x, which is a subset of z here, and we'll want then that there is some So this will be our A here. We we'll want some B, an elementary substructure of A. With again, this X subset of B here. And the size of X will be the size of B if X is infinite here. So I'm gonna quote this at some point here during the proof that comes.